Hey guys, Trevor Morris here. Welcome to Ask Me Anything. Hey Trevor, I have a question for you. So Salman Rushdie, the famous novelist, began his career as a copywriter at Ogilvy and Mather Advertising. And he said a lot of the things he learned back then he still uses in his writing today. Now you and I worked together many years ago in commercial production. And composing music for commercials is not easy. It is a discipline. And you have to capture an idea very quickly inside 30 seconds. So my question to you is, what did you learn back then while writing music for commercials that you still use in your scoring today? Hey, Terry. Thanks for that amazing question. Um, for me personally, this is a, a, a really important subject in terms of how it relates to my career. Um, which is just to rewind the clock a little bit. I entered the workforce at 19. Um, at that point, my dream was to be a record producer. I wanted to be Nell Rogers or Bruce Fairburn or Bob Rock or Quincy Jones or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I moved to Toronto uh, and entered into the very robust world of the recording studio scene uh, as an engineer, producer kind of thing. I wasn't actually composing music at this point. And in Toronto, which was just buzzing, it's a glorious time in my life. It's when I, quote unquote, became a man in this industry, at least that's how I, I recall it. From 19 to 29, for those 10 years, um, I basically went into the studio and just didn't come out. Uh, you know, 80, 100 hours a week uh, was, was normal, and I loved every minute of it. And although we had a great record scene for making records, the industry was based around the advertising world or the jingle world or adverts, whatever you want to call it. So we had all these robust recording studios with staff engineers. And I worked at the time, a studio was then called Sounds Interchange, which was, I think, the biggest studio in the world or second to one in Japan. It had like 16 rooms and a Foley stage and the first IMAX missing theater. This was such an incredibly amazing environment for me to be in. I was just in heaven. Um, and so basically from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. or so, uh, every studio was busy doing jingles, advertising, uh, radio, television, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, cut downs, 15s, 45s, stuff like this. And uh, this is before MIDI and synthesizer technology was enough to finish a track. So we had to do live, we had to do, we got to do live musicians every single day. So if the, uh, let's say the vibe of the jingle was rock and roll, but we'd have a drummer and two guitar players and a bass player and probably a guy on B3 or piano or whatever, and all the mics that go along with making a record, only this is for 30 seconds, and this has to happen really fast. Uh, so the musician set up quickly, the assistant engineers put the mics up quickly, the engineers gotta make it sound like the record, and I'm not kidding when I say like five minutes. 10 is like, we're, they're already, the, the, the clients are like, are we ready? Are we going? It's like 824 and we haven't recorded yet. So the, the, the agility and the craft of everybody involved in the jingle business in, in Toronto, where I grew up in, the, in this crazy world, was so on point uh, and so disciplined and so craftsmanship-like. Um, this is where I first fell in love with studio musicians, people, guys and girls, and just playing their instruments and just doing things on the fly, they just were blowing my mind. Um, and so wanting to be a record producer, what I got to do is make a record every day, only it was 30 seconds. That's lucky it was 60 seconds. And I got to observe the entire process of making a record from beginning to end, and then the voiceover, that pesky voiceover that's gotta sell the Coke or the Pepsi or their shoes. I got to see the whole thing happen organically from top to bottom as a wide-eyed 19-year-old. This is blowing my mind. Every day it was different. It's gospel, then it's rock, then it's EDM, then it's Dixieland, then it's Baroque, then it's a hybrid of those things. Um, it was such an exciting time for me and everyone was at their highest level. The, the guys who were the jingle writers had racks like the one behind me with all their synths in it and they would haul it from their writing room down to the studio with a patch bay and we would do a synth dump into the console first and while we're doing this, the engineer is stressing because the live musicians are funneling in and those microphones need to be tested. And this whole thing was this military style machine of precision and it was just a glorious time. 
obviously it was completely tough and hard and but for me I was just soaking it up and the I transitioned out of being one of being a record producer or being an engineer is the writers would come in the composers of the jingles and these guys were like rock stars to me you know they come in with their cool clothes and they're like the guys and they'd transfer their synths and they would conduct or more, not conduct more or less produce the, the the band on the floor listen to the to the recording in the booth make some EQ adjustments with the engineer, mix it, and make, it sounded like completely finished, completely finished music in three hours or something like this, you know? So the speed and the precision and the, 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 the focus that it took to do this every day, all day, all the time, and anyone who was involved was incredible. And thank God for catering because I couldn't afford food back then. So I would just nick a muffin from the breakfast plate and, you know, because we lowly assistants didn't get food. <laughs> I lived on leftovers from my clients for five years. So I I saw the writers and I'm like, that's where I want to be. That's cool. And I, I fell back in love with the idea of creating music. I was composing music when I was very, very young, like 13, and had kind of abandoned it for a while. So now I'm back and I, I decide I want to make my way from recording and production into writing and so I made my way into um, a variety of uh, jingle houses or music production companies. And the one that Terry O'Reilly uh, founded was called Pirate Radio and Television in uh, Toronto. Just an absolute juggernaut of a, of, a, as a, of a jingle agency in terms of music production. And he also did copywriting. Uh, Terry is one of the most astute madmen, if you will, uh, marketing genius. And he has an amazing podcast, which you guys need to check out called Under the Influence. We'll link up the link. I think it's under the influence.ca or something like that, but we'll find it for you. Um, he's, Terry's a fascinating guy and he's we've been friends forever. Um, I won't lie, the ad business is full of people who were uh, have become lifelong friends and people that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. There were a lot of not very nice people in that world, but it toughened me up. So I'm grateful for all those experiences. But Terry and I, um, he was very supportive of me moving to LA. I've been in touch ever since. Anyway, so I become a jingle writer, and now the craft of writing is really on point. Um, I had to write it, I had to orchestrate it, write the parts for soloists, conduct the band or organize the band quickly. Um, and then out of this came the discipline of writing for picture. Now we're talking. This is one of those chrysalis moments in my career. I'm 24 ish at this point and uh i start writing for for television commercials and i fell in love with the i was called the alchemy of music and visuals where one plus one equals three uh, and this is where i discovered it like an aha moment every day where you get this 30 second cut and you know the advertising clients this is their whole world they would niggle over every minutia did you hit that exact cut on the frame you know, uh, and then what about that cut? And then when this changed, I mean, it was just this, it was, the, it was a microcosm and a micro rather than macro focus on taking music, applying it to picture in a way that supports the narrative, or in this case, the dialogue of the announcer, the voiceover, um, and to help sell a product uh, with a team of producers on the music side and a team of advertising people. And this is group committee approval stuff. And I sincerely wish that every composer that I've ever had assist me or all you guys who are young out there, I wish you could go through a year of writing jingles. I know John Powell talked about it. Him and I think Gavin Greenaway back in their day were running an advert kind of thing. And the, the, the way you get exposed to every kind of criticism and developing a thick skin and writing to picture and hitting every cut and writing in every known style you've ever, I mean, you get a style thrown at you one day, you have no idea what it is. You're like, okay, you better learn real fast. It's Dixieland. What is Dixieland even? What is the what is it? You know, uh, and by the end of that day, or if lucky, the next day, you have better have it written, and it better be good. Um, highly competitive business, uh, internally, externally. So it is everything that Hollywood is, in a way, but in a very small, contained little thirty second package. So to answer Terry's question, what disciplines did I learn that I carry with me today? Every single one of them. Uh, in a way, there's a famous guy in the jingle world. I can't say his name, unfortunately. He was just a terrorist. Not a terrorist, like 
you know, but I mean, like, uh, he was a <laughs> not a very nice guy to work for, the guy that everyone hoped you didn't have to work for that day. And it was just terrifying. I mean, just terrifying to work for this guy. Uh, but then when I moved to LA, moved to Hollywood, I ran into just some really big situations with really big people. And I'm like, I got this. I've been through worse than this. You know, I've been through harder than this. I have people throwing staplers at me harder than you did. <laughs> God, that's funny. Inside joke. But um, it, it prepared me in every single possible way to become a film composer, but even more so a television because television is closer to the DNA of writing advertising in terms of craft. I'm not talking about talent or, you know, how good the music is, which obviously it has to be good. And film and games are on the slower spectrum in terms of taking more time. I'm not saying one form is better than the other in terms of music. I'm talking about the application of your craft in order to be able to get this job done. As Terry always said, you are in the applied arts business, which means you get paid. If you don't want to get paid, go do whatever you want, sing on a, from the mountaintop, and but be prepared to have nobody like it and no one pay you for it. As soon as you're getting paid for it, um, you need to get the job done quickly, done well, and in the time allotted. He always said to me that the definition of applied arts is doing the best job you can with the time you are given. And this was you know, two days to do 30 seconds or whatever. And it applies so much still to this day. Um, I'm going to do a video for you guys that I call uh, Six Minutes a Day, The Road to Being a Professional Television Composer. In the DNA of that conversation, which is how to do a half an hour or 35 minutes of score in a week or 40 minutes of score in a week, week after week, my discipline and my craftsmanship from that comes from my jingle days. So that those 10 years were... Absolutely invaluable. There's no way I would be the composer that I am today had I not had that underpinning, that bedrock, that foundation of how to work fast, take criticism, get a thick skin, you know, have your very best idea thrown out, your very worst idea praised, you know, and all that goes along with that world. Um, and then from at some point in my now I'm 25, 26, I'm thinking about how much I love, and I knew this this point was what I wanted to do with my life. This was my life's calling, to write music for visual media. Not a, I'm an okay songwriter, but it doesn't call to me the same way that writing for the alchemy of what I just spoke of. And then at that point, of course, the desire is to do longer than 30 seconds. And then the natural transition is to get into documentaries and wanting to do film and television. Uh, and as I mentioned in other videos, the reason I moved to LA was I tried very, very hard to break into the film and TV business of Toronto, and there just wasn't that robust of a industry. There is now. Now it's it's exploding. It's bananas. But when I was there and I was 28, 27, uh, I just couldn't break in. There was no white space. There wasn't a lot being done in post, and what was being done, they used the same you know, half a dozen composers to do everything, and that became the impetus to move to LA. But... What I brought to LA with me was my work ethic, my craftsmanship that I had learned and earned over 10 years of 80 hours a week-ish, just watching the minutiae and understanding and learning from people around me, of course, and asking for advice from composers who would listen to me. Most of them saw me as a threat, so they didn't tell me anything. Um, you know, I've never had a mentor in my career uh, in terms of being a writer, but Terry's the closest thing I've ever had to a guiding light, like a Yoda figure who always we kept in touch over the years and helped me navigate things and just keep perspective on it. And, um, you know, I have to say, uh, just to toot my own horn just a little bit, is when I entered the workforce in Los Angeles and I saw the craftsmanship level of some of the composers, I'm like, dude, I'm every bit as good as you are. Not talent, not music. I'm talking about the the world of executing music taking notes, spotting session, delivering, you know, all that stuff, engineering production, things that come so naturally to me, which I'm, I'm so fortunate my background had that in it, um, that my craftsmanship came in pretty much on point and with room to grow and has grown, of course, in my time here in LA. But it all comes back to me being 19 years old and working in the recording studio and watching the Titans. You know, it was New York, Chicago, Toronto. Those are the big three. That was the Mad Men of the 90s. Uh, we did all the advertising, you know, big, big, big campaigns, Olympic, Pan Am Games, Coke, Pepsi, Nike, the biggest there were. Um, so 
I, I am so grateful for that time, as hard as it was, as glorious as it was, uh, as messy as it was, um, making friends, making enemies. You know, you can't be su successful without a little bit of mess behind you. It's kind of how it works. But, um, you know, uh, even doing this video series, I, I consulted Terry and said, Terry, I'm thinking about doing a series for YouTube where I get to expose and give my trade secrets away and share my experiences. And what do you think? And he said, come over to, he was at his house in Palm Springs and he said, come on over, let's talk about it. He's like, dude, you have so much experience. You have more than you know to share. And this video is a great example of something I never would have related to you guys had it not been asked. So thus, ask me anything. So thank you, Terry, my friend, uh, my old friend. Uh, I appreciate you supporting me all these years. And what an excellent question, which is, what of my jingle career did I take with me? And of course, the answer is absolutely every single thing and then some. So I hope that helps. Um, again, I really appreciate talking to you guys and having a chance to share these experiences with you, especially during COVID, uh, to connect as a community. So please leave your comments below. Actually, one of my favorite parts of the day is answering your comments. If you haven't noticed, I try to answer every single one of you personally. That's me. That's not my assistant or anything. So if you want to know anything about it, post it below. Happy to answer. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and um, ask me anything.